Hey there, it's Audrey, producer at Spike and Crown Studios. Now's your chance to support a 3D animated horror film and get some awesome rewards in return. Check out spikeandcrown.com and visit our Kickstarter to make a pledge. You'll get our cutest dog, Sancho, the heroic basset hound, in full plush form. He's super cuddly, has a magnet nose, and comes with a real pet collar. Best of all, you can get producer credit, limited edition trading pins, digital collectibles, and much, much more. Check us out at spikeandcrown.com. That's S-P-I-K-E-A-N-D-C-R-O-W-N. There's a link at the top so you can visit our Kickstarter page, watch the trailer, claim these amazing rewards, and become a horror film producer. Isn't that cool? Once again, it's spikeandcrown.com, and we're live on Kickstarter. If you want to get your dogs some tasty, delicious, fresh-baked pumpkin treats that are great for their digestion, visit beautiesbiscuits.com. We've got turmeric varieties, peanut butter, all-natural peanut butter, parsley, helps with stinky dog breath. I actually grow it right in my yard, so this season I am harvesting my parsley Yay. and making fresh dog biscuits for you. And I also have CBD, great for senior dogs. Dogs that are anxious, um, hip pain, joint pain, turmeric and CBD is wonderful. I got all the things. Use offer code LIES and save 20% at beautiesbiscuits.com. Do it. Do it. Because your dogs will love you for it, and so will I. I'm Edward October, creator host of October Pod, and we're both listening to Calls of Death on the Darkcast Network. Welcome to Cause of Death, 100 Seconds to Midnight. I'm your host, Jackie Moranti. Let me first say that it's good to be back. The move was hectic and it was a mess, but I have my studio set up and I've been writing like a fiend to get caught up, so now we can begin Season 5, Restaurant Rogues, with a bang. This season is dedicated to my dear friend, Eric Carter Lundin, who has been bugging me to do foodborne infections since season two. I even let him choose the first topic, norovirus. I'll be doing a special cause of death crossover with 100 Seconds to Midnight next time for my 50th episode. I think the mix of the two will be interesting. I'm keeping the topic to myself so that you'll be surprised when it comes out, though. Thank you all for being patient through this move. I appreciate you all sticking with me, and I apologize for not getting myself together sooner. But, well, life. With that, let's get to it. We'll begin with etiology and pathology, of course. Noroviruses are small, non-enveloped, positive-sense RNA viruses with genomes of roughly 7.5 kilobases. They belong to the Calciveridae family of viruses and are known to cause worldwide outbreaks of enteric disease. The 5' prime proximal open reading frame ORF1 encodes a polyprotein which is cleaved by the viral protease known as PRO into six non-structural proteins, NS1-2, also referred to as P22 for human noroviruses, NS3, an antipase, NS4, another P22, NS5, the VPG protein that is covalently attached to the viral RNA molecules, NS6, the viral pro, and NS7, the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. ORF2 and ORF3 are translated from subgenomic RNA, giving rise to the structural proteins VP1 and VP2. Murine noroviruses express an additional protein called VF1, or virulence factor 1, from an alternative reading frame within ORF2. This is known as ORF4. 
the P22, P48, VF1, and VP2 proteins possess immunoantagonizing activities. The P48 non-structural protein localizes in the Golgi apparatus and induces rearrangement that resembles Golgi disassembly. This interferes with intracellular protein trafficking if it is overexpressed in cells. The P22 non-structural protein also contributes to Golgi disassembly and inhibition of the cellular secretory pathway. P22 blocks trafficking of COP2-coated vesicles from the endothelial reticulum to the Golgi. Mutations of P22 have given it the ability to induce Golgi disassembly and inhibit protein secretion. The norovirus VP2 protein prevents infected macrophages from upregulating molecules necessary for antigen presentation, including MHC class 1. MHC class 2, CD40, CD80, and CD86. CD4 plus T cells and antiviral antibody are then blocked from coming to the rescue. VF1 protein blocks antiviral cytokines, including type 1 interferon. And this contributes to the virulence factor and the shortened immunity that follows. All right. So what all this means, in short, is that immune response gets hijacked, the virus hides out for a bit, then dies off, but there is no long-term immunity left behind. Patients don't develop the same immunity to noroviruses that they do other viruses. Immunity only lasts between four and six weeks, leaving the patient vulnerable to contract the disease over and over. The average person will experience norovirus about five or six times during their lifetime. This also means that since the host secretory pathway is blocked, the immune response is likely impeded, so noroviruses can cause prolonged illness. And the virus can be shed for a prolonged period of time, thus furthering the spread of the disease. Noroviruses are classified into five genogroups. G1 through G5. Three of these groups, G1, G2, and G4, are primarily human viruses. G2 are porcine viruses. G3 infect bovines, and G4 contains murine noroviruses. They are typically named after the locations in which they were first identified. For example, Farmington Hill strain was responsible for an outbreak that occurred in Farmington Hills, Michigan. The most common symptoms of norovirus infection include vomiting, diarrhea, and stomach cramping. Less common symptoms can include low-grade fever or chills, headache, and muscle aches. Norovirus is mostly self-limiting. Symptoms begin about 12 to 48 hours after exposure and last for a couple of days. G2.4 strains are more associated with severe outcomes. This strain can be particularly fatal in neonates, children under 2 years of age, and the elderly. Asymptomatic infection is common in children. Excretion of norovirus in asymptomatic cases is detected in about 50% of the cases. Those who are immunocompromised are more likely to contract the disease and have prolonged illness. Treatment is limited to supportive care and administration of fluids in those who become dehydrated due to vomiting and diarrhea. Globally, norovirus is one of the leading causes of foodborne disease and deaths. Norovirus is responsible for approximately 60% of acute gastroenteritis in the U.S. each year. It infects about 20 million people a year in the U.S. and kills about 800. That number could be much higher since people often won't see a doctor. It's often thought of as the stomach flu, but flu viruses are far different. They're upper respiratory infections. Norovirus is transmitted primarily by the fecal-oral route, that lovely thing that we always talk about when we talk about foodborne diseases. But aerosolized viral particles and vomitus, food, 
water, and environmental contamination are all factors in the spread. Norovirus is often called the perfect pathogen, and the name fits. Infected people shed a lot of virus, but it takes as few as 20 individual particles to cause illness. The virus can live for weeks outside of the body, waiting on a host, resisting most active ingredients and cleaning products. The person who recovers after a few days can shed the virus for many days after, so it continues to infect others. There are over 150 strains of norovirus, so just because you can resist one doesn't mean that another one won't get you. And then there's that quickly waning immunity. Six weeks or so, and you can get it again. The only downfall that this virus has is that it can't replicate outside the human body, so it needs a host. While norovirus outbreaks can typically be traced to food production or restaurants, other sources are possible. For instance, a waterborne outbreak occurred in 1982. The outbreak affected roughly 1,500 people in a small community in Georgia. The highest rates of illness were reported closest to where the industrial businesses met with the municipal water systems. The water in the area tested high for coliform contamination. Other water-related outbreaks have occurred in camps, municipal water systems, commercial ice facilities, and in recreational waters. Exposures occurred while rafting or swimming. Water contamination is thought to come from the discharge of wastewater into rivers, streams, and other bodies of water. But there could be a natural distribution of norovirus that we don't yet know about. Oysters and other shellfish could also be to blame. Bivalves are thought to concentrate viruses and other microbes within their bodies. Rebedding of shellfish and depuration with purified seawater at increased temperatures have been used to reduce the burden of norovirus from shellfish in contaminated waters. Norovirus likes colder weather, and most outbreaks peak during the winter or in colder temperatures. The virus is heat sensitive, and it can be cooked away. Insufficient chlorination of city water supplies has been linked to some waterborne outbreaks. Waste stabilization ponds, submerged membrane bioreactor treatments, and activated sludge are ways that the treatment plants commonly deal with norovirus. Foodborne disease is the most common, though, especially in restaurants and through catering. Fruits, vegetables, and shellfish pose the greatest threat for transmission because they are consumed raw and could be subject to contamination from water sources. But don't forget that people who have been infected with norovirus are super spreaders. Food service workers should be washing their hands often, and food preparation areas should be cleaned properly to prevent spread. Hospitals and nursing homes are common places for norovirus outbreaks. These are called closed space outbreaks, and they present both logistic and financial burdens to healthcare institutions. Bed closures and staff shortages due to illness cost more than outbreak investigation and expanded laboratory testing. Person to person transmission is likely in hospitals. Usually, the index case will be a patient who then transmits the disease to staff, and staff pass it along to everyone else. Wash your hands. Patient indexed cases require more aggressive hygiene interventions. People can be lax when it comes to hand washing, and it's much harder for staff to encourage them to do so. You can't force someone to wash up. Schools and daycares are frequently implicated in norovirus outbreaks. Let's face it, kids are little germ machines. Daycare centers and schools offer multiple modes of transmission, including person-to-person, foodborne, aerosolized vomitus, and that ever-present fecal-oral route. Norovirus isn't picky. It will infect any age range from daycare to college. And since children are often asymptomatic, 
This complicates the issue. Norovirus is also a major cause of morbidity in the military. It runs rampant in training centers and fields of operation where people live in close quarters. The low viral inoculum, persistent viral shedding, and viral resistance to disinfection, plus environmental durability, make military bases a perfect storm for the perfect pathogen. Then, there are my favorite super spreaders, cruise ships and resorts. We've heard about numerous outbreaks of norovirus on cruise ships dating back several decades. Again, shared living and dining quarters, raw oysters, staff that refused to wash their hands, and possibly contaminated water. Then you add to the fact that it's frowned upon for staff or guests to report illness. It's a norovirus nightmare. So now that I've ruined your weekend plans to try that new bistro in town and you're going to take that money you've been saving up to board a ship to the Caribbean and buy a washing machine, let's move on to the history of the disease. The virus was previously known as Norwalk virus after it was first identified in stool samples collected during an outbreak in 1929 in Norwalk, Ohio. It was commonly called the winter vomiting disease in the area. Obviously, norovirus was no stranger in Norwalk. It seemed to strike every year when the weather grew colder. Researchers became interested in this particular outbreak, though, and they began studying the disease. The virus couldn't specifically be identified during this outbreak, but oral administration of filtrates prepared from rectal swabs of those affected were given to three prisoners at the Maryland House of Correction in Jessup, Maryland. Two of the three became ill within 48 hours, and they recovered about 48 hours later. Symptoms included mild diarrhea that lasted about 24 hours, anorexia, abdominal cramping, malaise, headache, and nausea. The virus was completely gone in these patients in about 96 hours. So, researchers decided to continue the experiment and gave the filtrate to nine more prisoners. Seven of these became ill. Two experienced vomiting only. One had to be administered fluid because he became dehydrated. Two had only diarrhea, and three had diarrhea and vomiting. Four had a low-grade fever that lasted 8 to 12 hours and all seven were lethargic and had headaches. All of them recovered in about 33 hours. So, researchers knew that the prisoners had gotten the disease because they gave it to them, but no one knew why there was an outbreak in Norwalk. Fast forward to 1968 when the virus was identified after 50% of students at an elementary school in Norwalk got it. And they, of course, brought it home to their families. This is when it came to be called the Norwalk virus. Researchers still didn't know where it came from or why it struck during the winter in Norwalk, but it had a name. Keep in mind that norovirus was all over the world, not just in Norwalk, Ohio. But researchers didn't make that connection right away. If we look back to 1929 and even 1968, Researchers had bigger fish to fry. Norovirus is relatively mild compared to some of the other things that they were working on at the time. Polio, measles, and diphtheria were far more important than a self-limiting stomach ache. That being said, norovirus couldn't be ignored. It was far more common than medical professionals were comfortable with, and it did cause its share of morbidity and mortality. So, more detailed studies began in 1990. This is when the gene structure was identified. Norwalk virus was one of a group of about 150 or so strains of human viruses known as noroviruses. Vomiting Larry was created by Catherine Mackison Booth at the Health and Safety Laboratory in Harper Hill, UK. She wanted to know how far norovirus particles could travel on the force of projectile vomiting. 
So she built a machine called Vomiting Larry. Vomiting Larry hurled fluorescent water so that projectile vomiting could be measured. Now, even if I hate reading long summaries verbatim, I have to do it. This model is too good to pass up. This is how Larry came into being. Projectile vomiting can occur without warning, and thus the simulated vomiting system was designed to represent a person projectile vomiting whilst in a standing position. The stomach of the system encompassed a plastic cylinder 3 millimeters thick, 95 millimeters in diameter to the outer edge, and 300 millimeters in length to comfortably hold one liter of fluid. The base of the cylinder was attached to a double-acting actuator, which would operate in a piston-pump fashion to force the fluid out of the cylinder by forcing compressed air in at the base of the actuator to push the piston up the shaft of the cylinder to force the fluid out. A stainless steel disc, 91.5 millimeters diameter by 15 millimeters thick, was attached to the top of the piston head at the top of the actuator. A rubber seal, 6 millimeters thick, was placed around the edge of the disc to ensure a snug fit into the cylinder and prevent fluid from leaking from the cylinder into the actuator. Two stainless steel cuffs, 10 millimeters thick, were located 100 millimeters from the top and bottom of the cylinder for support during simulated vomiting. The base and top of the cylinder were fitted with stainless steel plates 120 millimeters by 120 millimeters by 20 millimeters. The base plate comprised a centrally located hole 65 millimeters in diameter to allow the piston of the actuator to move freely, allowing the piston head to move up and down the cylinder. The top plate contained a 120 millimeter long stainless steel outlet tube with an aperture of 20 millimeters to the outer diameter that would be connected to the representative esophagus. The steel cap also had a tubeless 20 millimeter aperture to allow the cylinder to be filled with fluid. Once the cylinder was filled with fluid, the aperture would be closed by means of a screw fixture. The cylinder and actuator were fixed to a stainless steel plate 102 millimeters by 935 millimeters by 25 millimeters to support the system during the simulated vomiting process. An authentic mannequin head was used for the head of the simulated vomiting system. Airway Larry is an adult airways management trainer which simulates non-anesthetized patients. This trainer is used for practicing intubation, ventilation, suction, and CPR techniques. The mannequin has realistic anatomy and key structures including teeth, tongue, oral and nasal pharynx, larynx, epiglottis, arytenoids, false cords, true vocal cords, trachea, lungs, esophagus, and stomach. Science. Any middle school kid would be majorly impressed with vomiting Larry. And, if there are any middle school kids listening, they're probably going to go out and try and build a vomiting Larry. Why not? So, Larry did have a purpose. Booth found that vomit can fly more than 3 meters or up to 10 feet. This was important since we need to know how much cleanup is needed when this event occurs. Booth recommended disinfecting an area of at least 84 square feet to prevent the spread of norovirus from projectile vomiting. NoroCore began in 2011 and it was created by the USDA to produce guidelines for food producers, restaurants, and senior care facilities to combat norovirus. The study proved that enough virus to infect someone can be aerosolized during a vomiting incident. So this reaffirmed Booth's study. 
They also tested ways to kill the virus. Hand washing is still the gold standard for preventing spread, but it doesn't kill the virus. It just removes it from the hands. Warm water, soap, and friction loosen the virus particles so they can go down the drain, but they don't die there. Alcohol can kill some strains, but not all of them. Bleach is the best, but the CDC recommends a 1 to 5 solution, which is very uncommon. Most food prep areas use a 1 to 10 solution. The 1 to 5 solution smells like bleach, and it can harm fabrics and other materials. And that's it. That's the only thing that can kill norovirus. Most common household cleaners are powerless against it. Researchers have been unable to grow norovirus in the lab after more than 40 years of trying. They finally got that done in 2016. They succeeded by using unmodified gut cells from human biopsies and adding bile. This combination gave rise to a 10,000 to 100,000 fold increase in growth. Now, Mary Estes at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston is studying these examples to see what part bile plays in infection. This could lead to a viable vaccine if researchers can figure out how to prolong immunity. Norovirus is tricky. It's probably been around longer than we know, and evolution has made it a very proficient survivor. We have to remember that any bacterium, virus, fungus, or prion that I talk about only exists to survive. They are living beings. They all evolve in order to keep the genus going. Survival of the fittest. Okay, so that's norovirus. This season will be filled with all kinds of fascinatingly gross things, but Larry may take the cake. I want to thank my Patreon, Claire, and my Apple subscribers. Don't forget to go to my Patreon page and sign up there for all kinds of cool perks. Each level has a different perk added to it. There are ad-free episodes, bonus content, merch, bloopers, just a bunch of stuff that Patreon subscribers get. You can also now subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Subscribers there get my bonus content and ad-free episodes. You can run by my Ko-Fi account and just drop a donation there if you'd like. And the links to all the ways that you can support the show are in the show notes. If you'd like to save your money but you still want to support the show, don't forget to rate, subscribe, review, and most importantly, share these episodes with everyone you know. If you'd like to contact me, you can send messages through the website at www.causeofdeath100sex.net or you can email me at jackie at causeofdeath100sex.net. I would love to hear from you. Questions are always welcome. Or if you just want to say hi, that's fine too. Thank you so much for listening to Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight. And make sure you tune in next time for the 50th episode. It's going to be a doozy. <laughs>